The representational power of a deep neural network comes from stacking nonlinear layers. Intuitively, deeper models should learn more complex and expressive representations and yield better results. But deeper neural networks are more difficult to train. When we stack more layers, deeper models often have higher training errors, leading to poor performance on test data as well. This is counterintuitive. For example, we could construct a deeper model that performs at least as well as the shallow one by simply duplicating the layers from the shallow network and use additional layers to perform the identity mapping. So we know the solution exists, it's just that the optimization is difficult. To address this issue, researchers introduced the residual learning framework. Rather than hoping that the layers will directly learn the desired mapping, we explicitly designed them to feed a residual mapping instead. That is the difference between the input and the desired output. Here, each layer is a nonlinear function with its own parameters WL. But why do the residual connections make the training easier? Let's break it down. The output of the first layer, x2, is the input x1 plus the residual mapping f of x1. Similarly, here is the output of the second layer, x3. We can replace x2 with x1 and the residual mapping f of x1. Repeating this process recursively, we can represent the feature at any deeper unit L as the feature at any shallow unit plus a residual function. This identity mapping ensures that the features can be directly propagated from one unit to any other unit. This design has a nice backward propagation property. The gradient at the shallow unit consists of two components. First, the component that is directly propagated from the deeper unit, allowing the gradient information to flow directly. Second, the component that propagates through the intermediate weight layers. This alleviates the vanishing gradient problem and enables us to train deeper models. The residual connection design can be found everywhere, including models that understand images, language, play Go, and predict proteins 3D structures. It can be applied in virtually any type of layers like convolutional networks, attention, and multi-layer perceptron. But this design is somewhat restricted, as there's only one residual pass. A recent promising extension is to enable the network to learn the strengths of its residual connections. Here is how it works. Instead of using one single residual pass, we expand the input features by n times. This approach can be viewed as having unparalleled residual streams. But it's too expensive to run the layers n times. Therefore, we first aggregate input features x1, x2, x3, x4 using a weighted combination. The layer then processes these aggregated features to produce an output. As there's only one output residual mapping from the layer, we expand it four times using learnable scaling. We then add these rescaled residuals to their respective residual paths, resulting in the final output of the layer. However, in this setup, the amount of information exchanged between the residual streams is quite limited. To address this, we introduce a learnable linear transformation between the residual streams. Here, the transformation is parametrized by a 4x4 weight matrix. We can interpret the transformation as a feature router. By specifying the weights, we form flexible connection patterns that route features from one residual stream to another. The weights can take any values allowing the model to flexibly form linear combinations of features across multiple streams. Similarly, the aggregation and expansion weights allow the model to adaptively control how the information is combined and distributed across the multiple residual streams. This is the intuition behind hyperconnections. Now let's write this down more formally. We stack the features from multiple streams along the row dimension. Each feature is a d-dimensional vector, 
so the matrix XL has dimensions n times d. Here, the expansion rate n is 4. This is the input to the else layer. Feature aggregations involves computing a weighted combination of features from residual streams. We can concisely represent this as matrix multiplications. After computing the output of the layer, we expand and distributed the features to multiple residual streams. We can write this as multiplying an n by 1 weight vector with the 1 by d input features. Feature mixing across multiple streams is achieved using an n by n matrix. Finally, the output is just the addition of h and z. This is called hyperconnections, a paper proposed by Backdance earlier in 2025. But we don't want to learn these linear mappings directly because they will not be adaptive depending on the input of the layer. Therefore, hyperconnections introduce a parametrization where the values of the linear mappings are dynamically conditioned on the input. Here, there are two types of trainable parameters. The global ones that do not depend on the input, referred as static mappings. And the input-dependent parameters, referred as dynamic mappings. Hyperconnections show promising results over standard residual connections. Hyperconnections show up to 1.8 faster convergence and higher accuracy across multiple benchmarks compared to the baseline. This is great! However, when DeepSeq attempt to adapt this technique for their model training, they observe significant training instability. Why is this happening? Here is the equation for how a single layer of hyperconnections computes its output. Recursively extending to multiple layers, we can represent the features at a deeper level as two terms. The first term corresponds to the features at a shallow layer, successively transformed by the feature mixing matrices across the intermediate layers. The second term consists of the sum of the outputs from all previous residual functions. Let's compare this with a standard residual connection for clarity. In residual connections, we have an identity mapping. This identity mapping is essential for facilitating smooth information propagation. But in hyperconnections, we have a composite mapping of all the feature mixing matrices between the shallow and deep layers. Let's illustrate this problem with a simple one-dimensional example. Suppose the initial value is 1, and the feature at layer L involves the successive multiplications of a scalar edge. Let's see how the value evolves over the layers. When the value of edge is 1, we have identity mapping. The output at the layer L is still 1. However, if we increase the value of edge to 1.1, the output value exhibits a dramatic 100-fold increase. Conversely, when edge is less than 1, the output value rapidly decays as it passes through the layers. The instability becomes even more significant when edge takes on negative values, causing the output to oscillate dramatically. But how do we stabilize the training? To do so, we need to ensure that these linear mappings are well behaved. For example, the feature mixing matrix can have arbitrary numbers because it is unconstrained. The key idea is to make this matrix a doubly stochastic matrix, also known as the Burkhoff polytope. The requirement is that all elements must be positive, and each row and column must sum to 1. The resulting composite residual mapping across multiple layers also remains doubly stochastic. This effectively stabilizes the training preventing exploding or vanishing gradient problems. But how do we make this matrix doubly stochastic? The first step is to make all the elements positive. To achieve this, we apply an exponential function for each individual element. The exponentiation ensures that each output is strictly positive and increases monotonically with its input. But now, when we sum out all the rows and all the columns, their values are now 1. 
we use a simple iterative algorithm that alternately rescale all rows and all columns of the matrix to sum up to 1. Here is how it works. First, we rescale the sum of each column to 1. But after scaling, the sum of each row is still not 1. Therefore, we rescale the sum of each row to 1. But after rescaling all rows to sum to 1, that changes the sum of the columns. Fortunately, we can apply the alternative rescaling iteratively. With only a few iterations, we make the feature mixing matrix very close to a doubly stochastic matrix. It's very simple. To make this sum more academic, we refer to this process as projecting the feature mixing matrix onto the manifold of doubly stochastic matrices. Basically, make them well behave. This algorithm is known as the Sinkholm knob algorithm. For the other two matrices, the DeepSeq paper also makes some slight adjustments in terms of their parameterizations. Here is the parameterizations of the hyperconnections papers discussed before. Here is the one from DeepSeq. The key difference is that they change the activation function from 10 edge to sigmoid. The primary reasons are twofold. First, this avoids negative coefficients. Second, the new parameterization ensures that the aggregation and expansion weights are bounded. The values cannot be larger than 1 or 2. Compared to the original parameterizations, the new design makes the linear mappings more well behaved. But why is there a scalar 2 here? Remember that this is the weight we use to rescale the layer output before adding back to each residual stream. At the initializations, the parameters alpha and bias vector b are set to be small numbers. This means that initially the input to the sigmoid is very close to 0, and therefore the output is very close to 0 0.5. Multiplying it by 2 ensures that at the beginning of the training, the hyperconnections behave exactly like the standard residual connections. Now we understand how hyperconnections work and how to stabilize the training. But the expanded residual streams add significant GPU memory footprints and slows down the training due to excessive memory I.O. access. The DeepC paper proposed three efficient infrastructure design to mitigate this problem. First, to optimize memory and computation, the reorder normalization fuses operations with shared memory access and writes specialized kernels. This greatly reduces redundancy and resource bottlenecks. Second, the free intermediate activations after the forward pass and recompute them during the backward pass as needed, reducing memory usage through efficient block sizing and pipeline synchronization. Third, the schedule pipeline and kernel executions to maximize hardware usage by overlapping computation and communication. Overall, these designs enhance training efficiencies at scale. When using an expansion rate of 4, the training overhead only increases by 6.7%. Standard residual connections have remained unchanged for a long time, so it's exciting to see promising advancements like hyperconnections. I look forward to seeing more results and potentially wider adoption in the future. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.